Hello and welcome to another Daniel Revelation Talks. I'm Tony Mori here with Pastor Bill Hughes. And last time we discussed Revelation chapter 17. We did a few on those. And so today we're going to be talking about Revelation chapter 18. So Revelation chapter 17 talks about the whore of Babylon, who we identified as that mystery Babylon, Babylon the Great. We identified as the Roman Catholic Church system. No, uh, no change there. There's been over and over again, whether we've been looking at Daniel or Revelation, we've seen over and over again the Roman Catholic Church system coming uh, front and center. And so, again, we're taking another detailed look at that and how she rides the beast and controls the beast. The beast representing the political power, the woman herself representing that church side. So the religio-politico put together and church and state combined. And so when this takes place, we saw in Revelation chapter 17 that she will rule the world for a very short time with the ten kingdoms or separations of the earth. And then those kingdoms will eventually turn on her as well. And so you sort of back, when we get to Revelation chapter 18, we're going to back up just a little bit and actually see the final message, the final call to the world to leave Babylon. This is known as the loud cry. Sometimes it's called the latter rain, but really it's the loud cry, or people have referred to it as the fourth angel, being a part of the thir three angels' messages. It's really the loud cry of the third angel. So as we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we ask for your Holy Spirit to abide here with us today. We ask for your truth yes. and its simplicity, Lord. Yes. And we ask, Lord, that your people would awaken to their responsibility in this life. Amen. We have a message as a people. And we want to be part of this group that we're going to be studying today that will give the final warning to the world. Help us, Father. Help us who are in the church, who are asleep. Help us who are struggling to overcome sins, who are struggling to overcome doubts. Help us all to put our faith and confidence in you Amen. and be these people yes. that will receive the latter rain and will give this loud cry and will embody the perfect character of Jesus Christ on this earth. Amen. Please help us as we study today. Give us the correct understanding, Lord. Not according to men's interpretation, but according to just what your word says. Amen. That's what we pray for. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, keeping in how we've been doing it lately, Pastor Hughes, I, I will just read the whole chapter, and I'll hand it off to you to help us to understand. There's about 24 verses. So, Revelation chapter 18, right on the heels of Revelation chapter 17 and the whore of Babylon. So, it's really, we're starting off with the final call to leave Babylon here. And it starts in verse 1 by saying, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works. 
the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her, when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thyine wood and all manner of all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men and the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city which was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster, and all the company and ships, and sailors, and as many as trade by sea, stood afar off, and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads, and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found no more at all in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints, and of all that were slain upon the earth. Quite a bit to unpack there, Pastor Hughes. Mm -hmm. A lot was said, but can you help us understand? Indeed, there is a lot. It's a, it's a wonderful chapter. Uh, you know, I was noticing as, as you were reading that the concept of conspiracy uh, down here as Revelation 17 and 18 are describing, it's right down at the end of time uh, because Revelation 18, 1 tells us uh, after the setting up of the re-empowerment re of the Vatican in Revelation 17, at that time, when the papacy visibly, right in our face, has great political power and will then use that political power to enforce her Sunday tradition, it will be at that time that the Lord says, another angel will come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. Amen. So 
as we, I know I just got an email this week from the uh, Advent Messenger via Australia where the Pope himself today is, is saying that a moral authority needs to stand at the head of this planet. And the very clear implication in what Francis is saying is that he is that moral authority. So the papacy is already, and, and Francis has been doing that through all of the encyclicals that he has written from Laudato Si to Fratelli Tutti. He is setting himself up as the ruler of the world. So we can see very clearly how close we are drawing to Revelation 18 and verse 1. What's also interesting about it too, I think that I made a connection with Revelation chapter 18 and Revelation chapter 14 and the question kind of appeared in my mind as to why uh, this, this message of, in Revelation chapter 14 it says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And in Revelation chapter 18, it says, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And I was wondering as to why that message would need to be given. And it goes into detail, of course, in those first few verses about, about it's actually the habitation of devils. And I think the reason why is because people are deceived into thinking that this is a good this is a good institution. And so the message was needed in Revelation chapter 14 to tell people that no, the rejection of the second coming message that the, the, the Protestants did in 1844 caused them to be in a fallen state in the same way that the stoning of Stephen marked the, the fallen state of, of the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. So. There would be people, of course, the message needs to be given because there would be people that would remember John Wesley and Martin Luther and would see that these churches that were started by them, that they were men of God. And there's a, there's a temptation to believe that what's going on in the church is still approved of by God. So that's why that message was given then. And so now looking at the, at the final events in Earth's history, of course, this wouldn't be during the Reformation because during the Reformation, everybody knew that the Roman Catholic Church was bad news with the, the inquisitions and the lies and hypocrisy and false doctrines that came out of that church and the millions upon millions of people that they killed for, for practicing righteousness or, sorry, um, uh, religious liberty and, and freedom of conscience. And so the message would need to be given because people living in our day who are seeing the corruption of society and how we're spiraling, they, there's the temptation to say, you know what, Pope Francis is right. We do need a moral authority. And in a way, he is. It needs to be Jesus on a case-by-case -case basis. But as you said, he's trying to set himself up that way. Mm -hmm. And people will begin to come to the conclusion that he's presenting that, yeah, we do need that moral authority. And here is Revelation chapter 18 warning us, no, don't go there. Don't join hands with Rome. Don't follow Rome. Don't be a part of the World Council of Churches. Don't be a part of the ecumenical movement. She has not changed. She is a habitation of devils. Absolutely. On, on all counts from what you said. Um, you know, in, in Revelation 14, verse 8, of course, the apostate Protestant churches fell in the time frame of, the, of 1844. Uh, that's, a, that's a fact of history. Uh, whereas here in Revelation chapter 18, we're, we're talking here primarily about the papacy, right. Babylon the Great. And of course, in Revelation 14, verse 8, uh, it's not Babylon the Great. It's simply Babylon has fallen. Right. Well, 
Uh, but the only times we see the concept of Babylon the Great, we saw it in Revelation 17, 5. Now we see it again here in Revelation 18, verse 2. So again, we, we see this, this re-setting uh, up of the papacy's power as they did through the Dark Ages. And of course now, here at the end of Earth's history, we're seeing it happening again. Right. And uh, to combat these forces, because again, uh, as verse 3 said to us, very succinctly, uh, Revelation 18, verse 3, it says, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So that's talking about the papacy's fornications. Right. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Well, there's the political elements in the world, the, the leaders, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So right here, in a very succinct fashion, we have three of the four entities united together at the end of time in this colossal worldwide conspiracy to take the world captive in sin, in disobedience to the law of God. And ultimately will lead to the destruction of, the, of all those who heed the papacy's call. So, you know, verse 3 just says it so boom, boom, boom. Right. Uh, you don't have to go to different verses. It's all right there in one verse. So in response to this massive conspiracy at the end of time, God will have a response. And that's what Revelation 18 verse 1 is. It, this is heaven's response to this colossus that is all over the earth controlling churches, politicians, the flow of money. I mean, what more could there be to, to gain control of a world than what we have identified here in Revelation 18? What else could they have? They've got it all. They've, right. they've got the whole pie, so to speak. Right. But God has a response. God has not been idle. God is not being uh, left unawares by what is going on in this earth. And so heaven's response to the devil's system of the papacy, apostate Protestants, the political powers, the business powers of earth, heaven's response is the pouring out as the Bible says, of great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Now, we can say, well, well, in what way will heaven manifest that power? And I think the best way we can illustrate it is there was another time. There was another place in old Jerusalem when the Messiah had just been slain and it appeared as though the, the Roman Empire and her minions were completely in control of the earth. But God had a response. And we read about that response in Acts chapter 2 when the disciples are in the upper room they're praying, they're confessing their sins, they're asking forgiveness of one another for perpetrating gossip or lies against each other. They weren't confessing sin. Right. I think that needs to be clarified. The disciples were not confessing sin to one another. They were saying, hey, you know, I mistreated you. I thought ill of you. I was wrong in wanting to be the greatest. Uh, and so they drew close together. And in response 
to their prayers, their solicitation, their need. The Bible says that cloven tongues like fire came down. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit rested upon them. So in this experience in Old Jerusalem, which many Bible writers in the Old Testament have called the early reign, the power of the Holy Spirit came on those praying disciples. And in the first century, the world was turned upside down by that manifestation. We read, of course, in Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, the Bible tells us that so powerfully did the Holy Spirit come upon them. The Bible says, Colossians 1 verse 23, If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. When the Holy Spirit fell in early reign power, the entire then known world heard the message of Christ and Him crucified. That's amazing. Isn't that awesome? And that's yeah. before, that's before uh, YouTube and, and, <laughs> and planes, travel by planes and, and just uploading something onto, onto the internet. Absolutely. So that, that's amazing. Absolutely. Revelation 18 is telling us at the end of time, the latter reign of the Holy Spirit is going to come down with such power, with such authority, that again, the entire world will hear. And you know, the entire world is not just going to hear the messages from heaven of Revelation 14, the three angels' messages. The world is going to see. They're going to see in the people that give the message the very character that those three angels' messages is calling on all humanity to reflect. And it will be the character of Christ which will be manifest in obedience to all of his commandments. So, just as in the first century, early reign, Holy Spirit, the disciples reflected. They not only preached it, but people, as it says in Acts chapter 4, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So it, it was reflected, and we're going to see it again. But this time, it's not just going to be in Jerusalem, because the Bible says the earth was lightened with his glory. So the Holy Spirit, now, you know, I, I know there's, there's so much prejudice, there's so much hatred, there's so much... Uh, well, I don't know how else to say it, but hatred manifests towards Ellen White. But Ellen White has left for us two beautiful statements about this time in Revelation 18. In a collection of letters that she wrote to uh, some Adventist leaders around the turn of the century, she wrote, she said, I saw that the latter rain was coming as the midnight cry with ten times the power. So when the latter rain comes, we are talking about power like this world's never seen. Never seen it before. Uh, when I first read her statement, my immediate thought was, well, it's coming with ten times the power of the midnight cry, 
Well, how powerful was the midnight cry? That, that's the obvious question. Well, I went back to the book Great Controversy, which is an absolute masterpiece on the history of the church from the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD all the way down to the new earth. And I would only encourage anyone who has been uh, taught to think ill, taught to embrace the hatred and the prejudice against Ellen White, to please, please just pick up the book, The Great Controversy, and read it. Just read it from cover to cover. And if, if you find error in there, if you find fault in there, show me. Show me the error. But friends, I will guarantee you that you will find beautiful, connected, interlocking truth from 70 AD to the new earth like you have never seen it before. And we offer that book on our website. Yes. Write to our website. Send in your name and address. We will send you a free personal copy of The Great Controversy. The Great Controversy, page 400, tells us that the midnight cry spread over the land like a tidal wave. Now, when you put those two statements together, the latter rain is coming, friends, with ten times the power of a tidal wave. We're talking about multiple tsunamis hitting the earth all at once. What's going to stand in front of that? What stood in the way of that tsunami that hit in... Uh, what was it, Indonesia back in the, in the 1990s? Yeah, uh, there was the tsunami there that hit in, um, in the Indian Ocean, yeah. off the coast of India and Indochina and Indonesia in that area. It was uh, 2004. Was it 2004? Yeah. Okay. What stood in the way of that? <laughs> Nothing. I mean, there, there were, there, there's pictures of pre-tsunami, and there's these gigantic... Hotels, motels, up and down the strip, right there. A few days later, they go back and take pictures. They're gone. Nothing stood in the way of that tsunami. And friend, we're looking at 10 times the power of a tidal wave. This world, um, you know... The sacrifice of Jesus, where would we be without it today? It was the greatest event, the greatest event in the history of this planet. But we, living down here at the end of time, we are going to see the second greatest event in the history of our planet. We're going to see the third person of the Godhead come down with power that is going to come with such force. It's going to knock down every barrier in its wake. Everything is going to go. So heaven will have a response to the setting up of the papacy and all of her minions taking control of this world one last time. And another thing I think is good to point out too is your, that this is founded upon the Bible in particular, the Old Testament understanding of the early and the latter rain. And the early and the latter rain had everything to do with the harvests. This was the economy. This was the, the religious structure of the nation of Israel. And just on time, the first outpouring, the early rain that was given to the disciples and apostles, 
in the upper room there at Pentecost, right on time, right on the day. Pentecost was a feast day that was all about the harvest. Mm -hmm. And at that point, they began to reap a harvest of souls. Amen. And so the latter rain is meant in, a, in the Jewish economy especially, but in, in farming and agricultural in general, that the latter rain finishes the ripening for the harvest, for the last harvest before winter. Mm -hmm. So it's the last harvest. And if we're looking at this, if we're going back, we can, we can connect all these dots. It all fits perfectly. This is going to happen around the time of the Day of Atonement, which we've been living in since 1844. So the latter rain is going to come. And it's, it's happening right around the same time, fulfilling the prophetic dates hmm. in the feast days. Hmm. And also, it will bring the harvest to a close. And as we learned in Revelation chapter 14, when we connect it with what Jesus said in his parables, the harvest is the end of the world. Absolutely. So this is, in, in, in no uncertain terms, this is the final warning, the outpouring of the latter rain, which brings the third person of the Godhead to come down and empower God's people to give the loud cry. This is the final warning before probation is closed and this earth's harvest has been harvested completely. Amen. Absolutely. So it all fits perfectly together. Oh, absolutely. Not only in the natural world, but in the spiritual realm as well. Right. And in connection with the Jewish feast days. Right. Absolutely. You know, the, the early rain, as you said, in nature, the early rain caused the seed to germinate right. and to begin to grow. The latter rain came at the end of the, the season to help the plant and the, the fruit to come to full maturity. And so we have, in the early rain experience, spiritually speaking, the power of the Holy Spirit is given. As Ezekiel 36, verse 27 says, it says, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Amen. The power of the Holy Spirit in the early reign is to empower us to keep all of God's commandments. Not by ourselves, right. but through the power, as Ezekiel said, I will put my spirit within you. It's not, we can't do it ourselves, but we can submit to the power of the Holy Spirit Amen. to empower us to obey God's commands. When the latter rain comes, spiritually speaking, the latter rain will seal the character, will seal the fruit that is in the person's life. If it's ready and they've experienced the early rain, they will receive the latter rain. If we haven't embrace the early rain, we won't get the latter rain. It's that simple. If, if a plant did not germinate, or if a plant did not begin to grow and begin to have growth on the plant, the latter rain was worthless to it. All, the latter rain would come and just destroy it because it was not strong enough to endure. Same thing, same thing. That's why the, the idea that we can be saved in our sins is so absolutely heinous. It's a rejection of the early rain. And again, if we've rejected the early rain, we will never be ready for the latter rain. So 
absolutely critical. And I know I've said this before, but I'll say it again. The, the, the Bible warns us in the book of Timothy that there would be people that would have a form of godliness but would deny the power. And that's what that is. Absolutely. When you're saying I'm saved in sin, you are denying all the pages of Scripture, whether you're talking about Romans 6 or Romans 13 or Galatians chapter 2 and, there, and many, many other passages in the Bible that tell us that we can overcome sin and we, we can keep God's commandments. Not through our own strength, but through His, because then He gets the glory. It's not us doing the work, Absolutely. but we submit to Him to do that. So when people deny that message and say that they'll never be perfect and they'll, nev and they'll be saved in sin, then they are literally taking a form of godliness, but they're mm -hmm. actually denying the power that God wants to give to them. Amen. Absolutely. Which is a hallmark of the last days. Absolutely. Absolutely. Revelation 18, verse 2, he cried mightily with a strong voice. Of course, now this is the voice. He is singular. He represents the uh, great power, his glory, which is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit will cry mightily with a strong voice through his children through those who are in submission to him, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So the Holy Spirit and those in submission to him are going to call the world to the judgment, to the judgment that will befall Babylon the Great. These people filled with the Holy Spirit will denounce the papal system. You know, I hear so many people so often saying to me, well, you know, this is offensive, you know, to call the papacy the Antichrist. That's offensive. Friends, it is is the truth of God for this time. To say that we love, we love our Catholic brethren and sisters and not proclaim what that system is, is, is the most hateful thing we can do. Mm. It's hateful. You know, you look at Babylon and you look at the verses Cody read about the judgments that are going to come on the papacy and all that are united with her. But Revelation 18 is describing a, a, burning, a burning world, an oven, where all of these entities are inside this oven. Now, what are we going to do? We're outside of the oven. We're outside of this burning, smoldering ruin. Are we going to sit there and say, all of those inside there, I love you. <laughs> Is that what we're going to say? If, if I go home today, or Cody goes home from, from being here at the church, and our house is on fire. Am I going to sit there and say, well, you know, I, I love my family. I, I hope you guys are doing okay inside. I mean, that, that is so disgusting. That is so disgusting. And it's so ludicrous that people in Adventism today could say, I just want to talk about love. Well, friends, love declares to somebody in a burning, smoldering house that's about to fry them to a crisp, get out of there before you burn to death. That's the most loving thing you can do, friends. I mean, you don't even have to think about it. But this idea that I'm not going to declare who Babylon the Great is, because I don't want to offend, because I love them? No, you don't, friend. You love yourself. 
you love yourself and refuse to accept the consequences of plain speaking. Amen. And, and as this verse makes so clear, if you are not giving that message, you can't give the loud cry because you have to denounce the Roman Catholic Church system in order to be giving the loud cry as specified in these verses. So if you're not giving that message, if you're pulling punches, watering down messages, changing books like the Great Hope, absolutely, then you can't give the loud cry. And if you can't give the loud cry, that means you're not going to receive the latter rain. And if you're not going to receive the latter rain, God says that judgment begins in the house of God. So if you don't receive the latter rain and you are a Seventh-day Adventist, probation is closed for you Amen. after the latter rain falls if you do not receive it. Amen. So it's our job. So you can know for a certainty whether or not this person or that person or this ministry or that ministry is doing God's work in preparation for the latter rain and the loud cry by testing them by Revelation chapter 18 and verse 2. If they are not talking about the papacy as the Antichrist, if they're going to Moscow, for instance, to have meetings with papal legates and other ecumenical movements, folks, that's not the message. And that message Amen. is on a bullet train to the lake of fire. Amen. I want to I want to uh, dovetail on that, Cody. Okay. Here we have Babylon the Great. It's the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Does that sound like a Christian organization to you? Does that sound like a Christian organization with which we want to unite in ecumenical activities? Folk, how long are we going to justify Gwenun Diop, Ted Wilson, and others, other leaders in Seventh-day Adventism, placating and working in ecumenical union with these apostate powers. How long, friends? The Bible does not say that Romanism is Christian. The Bible does not say that apostate Protestants are our Christian brothers. It doesn't say that. It says that the papacy and the apostate Protestants have gone so far away from God, they have become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now that's what the Bible says. In light of Revelation 18 and verse 2, how long, how long will we justify Gwenun Diop Ted Wilson, and ecumenical Adventist leaders to spend thousands upon thousands of dollars to call these systems Christian when the Bible says the exact opposite. How long, friend, will you support that? I mean, this is... Uh, <laughs> right, and the message to those churches for the people... and. Again, as you said earlier, this is not a knock against individuals within those systems, but the systems course, themselves, which is why verse 4 says, come out of her, my people. So the call, the call to those systems is to come out. We can't give that message if we're calling them Christian brothers, if we're joining hands with them in ecumenical movements, Absolutely. if we're... If we're meeting with them and not declaring verse 2 and verse 4. We cannot be a part of this group. Why, why 
does God say those things that are so condemnatory of those systems? Why does he do that? Number one, because that's what they are. Right. Number two, the Lord knows if people remain in those systems and continue to imbibe the spirit of those systems, they're going to be lost. Why would somebody leave something if they think that what they're involved in is so wonderful? Why would they? They wouldn't. Right. That's why the Lord in verse 4 of Revelation 18, he says, come out of her, my people. Most of, of the followers of Jesus Christ that are living up to all the light they have are still to be found in Roman Catholic and apostate Protestant churches. And God says, my people come out of those apostate systems. Yes. How is it that Seventh-day Adventism today is running headlong into those apostate systems? How can that be, friends? And we support it, and we condone it, and we get mad at people that condemn Gwinnun Diop and Ted Wilson? for their ecumenical insanity? Revelation 18 is clear. It's very clear. And this is the sure word of Bible prophecy. As Cody shared in the sermon this morning from 2 Peter chapter 1. This is the sure word of prophecy. Whereunto we do well that we take heed as unto a light that shineth into a dark place. So the light of Bible prophecy is shining upon this earth today, showing us where God is not. And the Lord is calling on all his people to forsake these apostate organizations. Amen. Verse 3, and then we'll, I think we'll close. Okay. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Well, friends, we know clearly that fornication is the unlawful union of a man and a woman who should not be together. Spiritually speaking, we have the papacy uniting and using and controlling the governments of the earth, the political leaders of the earth, to do her bidding. She used the governments through the dark ages to kill God's children, to promote false teaching. The Bible says that all nations have become fornicators with the Vatican. And in that church-state union, the papacy dominates the state and pushes the state to carry out her institutions and to sustain her traditions. The kings of the earth are involved. The merchants are involved. We have a conspiracy, a worldwide conspiracy. In every facet. In every facet. I'm just so thankful today that um, God has not left us to be in the dark as to who's going to come out on top in this, in this struggle. And I'm thankful today that we still have the choice to say, 
Lord, I'm going to be on your side. I'm going to choose you this day. And that's the wonderful choice that we have. And that's the wonderful choice that God has given to everyone that still finds themselves today in Roman Catholic and apostate Protestant churches. God is calling you, friends, to come out of those systems to embrace the three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14. And you know, throughout the Bible, as we've looked at Daniel, and as we've looked at Revelation up to this point, you see the Catholic Church win and win and win and win. But as Revelation chapter 18 verses 1 through 4 makes it very clear, God will have a response. And verse 4 ends by saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Her judgment is coming. Absolutely. And so we have a decision to make. Are we going to be on God's side, or are we going to trust in the traditions of men? You have in, those, in verse 3, you see the, the doctrines of Rome have made the nations drunk. Hmm. Church and state have come together with the, pol with the uh, political powers and with the, the business powers. Every piece of economy has been intermingled with Romanism and controlled by her. Hmm. So it's a, it's a worldwide conspiracy that permeates literally everything that we do, everything that we buy, everything that we see going on on the television, on political events. We think that this country is after that country, and it's all just a circus. It's all just a facade. Absolutely. Rome is in control, but her judgment is coming, and God's people win in the end. Amen. Amen. Will you close us out in prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we're grateful today for the sure word of prophecy yes. that still shines as a light in a dark place. Yes. Help us to ever cling to that word. Help us to ever share that word. Fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit to those ends. Yes. And bless, bless all of your children that are still in these wicked systems of Roman Catholicism and apostate Protestant churches. Yes. Bless them, Father, with the power of the Holy Spirit that they would forsake those communions, that they would expose those communions yes. so that you and you alone would be glorified and praised. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.